You cannot be confident without having courage first. You don't wake up as an expert in anything. You have to courageously go out, put yourself out there to experience whatever it is. You gather that feedback, you adjust accordingly, and then you go at it again, right? It takes that courage to then develop the confidence to do anything in life. A good coach allows that freedom of discussion and imagination to happen because the answer is inside everybody. We just need somebody who's talented enough to pull it out of us so we hear it in our own words. Jessica and Jeff, welcome to the Generation Youth Podcast. Thank you for being my guest today. Appreciate the invite. Thank you. Yes. Well, well uh, Jeff and I connected uh, through a mutual friend, Tammy Matheny, and he, uh, in our conversation together, I realized that your organization provides so much value to youth and we have so much in common. I wanted to get, I wanted our audience to hear from you, what you're doing, your passion for youth development, your passion for helping youth uh, in this time. And I, I couldn't wait for this. This is, this has been a fun conversation uh, that I've been looking forward to. So if you would not mind, our audience would love to hear a little bit about you instead of me talking the whole time. They want to hear from you. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself to uh, the Generation Youth audience. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so uh, thank you so much for having us first and foremost. It's just a great pleasure and honor to know that people out there are interested and passionate about the work that we do. So my name is Jessica Villegas. I'm the founder of Highlight Coaching and Consulting. And we started our business just shy of three years ago in the height of COVID. So how that all came about was I myself was a troubled youth. I really struggled to make good decisions, to know who I was, to know what I wanted, to know how I was going to get there. I'm from a small town. I wasn't provided a lot of advantage growing up. There was a lot of toxicity and just different things that I had to overcome a lot of adversity in my young years. And as I became a young adult, I made lots of mistakes. I Some were financial, others were academic, and many of them were who I chose to surround myself with. Mm. So I hit about age 30 and I was like, we need to kind of change this whole song and dance. We haven't finished college yet. We need to go and do that. And then we need to figure out what we're going to do with our adult lives. So, well, with our adult life, me, my adult life. So I finished college. I walked across the stage when I was 32 years old, finally got my bachelor's degree after 365 credits. So that right there kind of paints the picture of... How many credits did you say? 365. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's, that's two not degrees. bachelor's, guys. That's two bachelor's. Yes, I changed my major a lot. It took me a long time to learn who I was, what I wanted, and how I was going to get there. I was also a single mom of two young girls when I finished my bachelor's degree. Um, so that kind of paints a picture of other decisions that I made that, you know, could have been done differently had I known myself better at a younger age. And then I moved into the corporate world. I worked in hospitality management for, for a good 13 years up until this point when I graduated. And then I moved into supply chain management. For seven years. And I noticed some very common things in both of those industries, and they related a lot to my younger self. And what that was, was confused about who we are at a young age, even after, even after we've graduated college. You know, I had people joining my team. I was doing interviews. Um, I was guiding young leaders and, um, they would have degrees in pre-med or pre-law or engineering or psychology, and then they would be working in supply chain. That was very, uh, I don't know, it just made me very curious. So I started asking them, like, why? Why are you here? What brings you to this interview? You went to school for this and you're applying for a logistics coordinator position. What happened with that? well, I thought I wanted to do that. Then I decided I didn't, or I'm confused. I'm still figuring it out. But I just heard time and time again, really that like deep seated question, which is who am I? What do I want? And how I'm going to get there. And it, it just always bothered me because I also was that young person. And even 
in a sense, into my 30s, I was still that person. And I wanted to figure out how can I help these kids? It would be so cool if we could help these kids figure this out when they were, when they were younger, right? And then COVID hit. Um, I found myself unemployed for about 90 days. And in this time, I connected with something which is really great. I highly suggest anyone uh, listening connect with, with, which is your Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. And in that, I found that youth coaching was what I needed to do. Developing this life skills program is what I needed to do. Young people needed help, feeling good about who they were, what they wanted, confident about going out there and getting it, and fearless without abandon, right? So that's how Highlight was born. That's how I became a coach. And we're doing really good work. Well, Long intro, you. sorry. <laughs> we're good. good. I actually took notes. I was I taking notes of some I'm things so that I was. <laughs> Jeff, how about you? I don't know how much time I have left. So. Oh, you got as much time as the world wants. <laughs> well, my name is Jeff Forrester. And uh, I work. Yeah, exactly. I work with Jessica here at Highlight. And my background is has been 30 plus years in the workforce. I know I don't look that, but I have been working since I was a, a young man. And more about me specifically is that I'm a father of a of two, well, almost two teenagers. One is a 15-year-old 10th grader and a soon-to-be 13-year-old 7th grader, which qualifies me to help other parents <laughs> with those because I'm not perfect by any stretch of the means. And my background, like I said, has been in in business and corporate experience and learning from these adults and the challenges that they have, you see a lot of the same similarities in 15 year olds and cats that walked by my screen. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> I don't think well, I've ever had If that. I didn't grab him, he would have been all in the screen. So I 125 or 130 episodes. I don't think I've ever had a cat go across this. Oh, wait, it'll really happen cool. again, I'm sure. <laughs> that was so cool. Oh, goodness. There Peter's he is. Around. He's in the background now. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, from that, it's it's one of those things of being able to help people and help people, whether I'm a day ahead or six months ahead of where they are, is just being able to pour into other people and to share the things that I've learned that 50 year olds carry with as well as 15 year olds. And if we can help the 15 year old and equip them with things that will prepare them throughout that next 35 years, imagine where they'll be at 50, the decisions that they make the the life direction that they can take to have more clarity more vision and then ultimately have the success that they want to accomplish you know i love having this conversation because i, I just feel synergy coming through the screen already because your stories and your passion for working with you it, it resonates with me so much on 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 who i want to surround myself with because that's you know what i want to do i've always had a passion to work with youth and, and to be able to work with them and I love the things that you guys identified. Um, Jeff, you and I may have discussed this, and, and I know I haven't mentioned this to Jessica, but we interviewed here at, at, at our organization about 2,500 youth since 2016, and we asked them what their biggest problems were. And then we started classifying them after we heard all these answers and we recorded them and we kind of put them into three major categories. There were some, there were some outliner answers that were like location-specific. You know, hey, you know, our town doesn't have movie theaters or, you know, uh, some answers that were very specific to some Indian reservations, too, that, that we had. I remember those sticking out. But most of the answers fell into one of three categories. The first one you hit on it would write the very first topic you talk about their identity, their self-image. Who am I? I'm a failure. I'm not successful. I can't see. That was about 85, 90 percent of the answers. 90 to 85% of all the respondents said that as part of their answer. Second one was uh, relationships. Who, who do I belong with? Where's my tribe? Who's my friends? I don't know how to do that. And then the last one was dealing with purpose and goals, which you hit upon too. You know, how do I, how do I get to where I'm going? You know, how do I, how do I get there? Once I figure it out what I want, you know, that's goal setting. And how do I get there? How do I make a plan? So when you were talking about that, I mean, it was uh I was like, you know, I was getting all excited over here. I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. So you see why I, my intro went so long, right? Because I get so excited about it. I know. I, it's it's hard not to. I mean, to, to be able to talk about, to, to it, it just excites me. 
to to know that there are other folks that are in the trenches that want to help as well, help them. So you, you mentioned those three things. I mean, there are other problems, issues that you guys see that youth are struggling with. I think that all those things kind of fit in those care those things. Mindset, obviously, you know, their growth mindset, but that that kind of works with those other three in, in, in tangent as well. So what are you guys' thoughts? Anything else? I think those are the big things. And then yeah. I'll, I'll let Jessica comment to those. If you want to get tactical and more specific, one of the challenges that we see that really carry from, you know, adolescence all the way into adulthood, time management, distraction management, task management, some of those real specific things that can impact all of those. You can have all the big answers, but if you don't know how to organize your day and process your day, which most people do not, regardless of age with any efficiency, that's one of the things that I see that the light bulbs start to go off of figuring out, okay, that's my challenge. I can't accomplish more because I can't do more because I don't mm. have enough time. And so that's where you go into auditing their day and then just figuring out what works. You know, there's some people that need to program their day by 15 or 30 minute increments. And there's other people that would make their head explode if they had to get that granular on their day. And so it's, it's working with them to identify what those tactical things are. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely one of the big things. I think one of the other things is helping them to develop that sense of agency, you know, like, Hey, I'm actually capable of making this decision for myself. When we are teenagers, we feel like we don't have control, right? We feel like we need permission from, from everyone for everything, right? Including our peers. We need permission for to like to wear this outfit. Would my friends accept me or not accept me? I need permission to hang out with this group or that group. And then further, I need permission to spend my time this way or that way or drive or have a job or any of those things, right? But when we're showing up as our best selves in life, we have more freedom than we realize. Mm. And one of the things that young people like to say is, uh, my teacher gave me a, a D in the class because they don't like me. Oh, yeah. Or my parents are being controlling and they grounded me. Well, you had to participate in that outcome in some way. So creating that self-awareness to then generate the agency like, oh, wait, I have control of this, actually. If I could be more mindful of how I'm showing up as my values and I'm keeping my vision in mind, I'm bringing my best self to the table every day. And then I'm seeing I have more freedom. My grades are better. My relationships are better. I'm getting along with my parents. They're supporting me more. My Maybe I'm making better friends and I have a more supportive friend group. But you have to first help them identify that they have more control and they actually sit in the driver's seat more than they realize. And then the other, like the flip side of that coin is parents helping them learn. So when we're working with kids and families, we, we create that feedback loop with the parents. How are things going at home? You know, we don't div divulge the details because we've got that confidentiality, but we help parents to be successful too by giving them tools, but helping them to understand this is a partnership. You know, teenagers... The, the parenting happened in elementary school, but as they get older and, and they develop this responsibility, we have to give it to them and we have to be partners with them in that. So I think that's one of the really unique things that comes out of the program. It's like a byproduct aside from the things that we specifically hit on already. I was thinking immediately of a, of a conversation I had with uh, some parents about their daughter recently that was struggling with those life skills that Jeff, you were talking about time management and those things because of, of having uh, ADHD and, mm -hmm. and having to take some medication to help control that, but it still was affecting her. And as a result of her not having the good skills to maybe program her day, like you talked about, it was heavily affecting her self identity her self image she looked at herself as a failure i cannot accomplish this and it was affecting relationships and obviously was affecting goals which you know we, we talk about those things all are you know even though kids may say one answer more than another they're so intertwined you cannot develop one without developing the other effectively right. so when you guys were talking about that i was immediately thinking about 
how applicable it would be to help her in those many, I mean, it just having micro steps, you know, success, one successful day, how much that could help her on her journey. Yeah. Or even for her an hour, like just Ooh. getting it even smaller of like it's stacking those small wins. If you can have an accomplishment that you're proud of within an hour of being able to stay focused that she may have never stayed focused before. And now she's like, okay, I can do this. Now, what kind of system can I create? The other challenge that we see, especially with people who are, are giving di given diagnosis is that they've now been given a label that they can use as an excuse. Yes. And so now they can extend mm -hmm. all of the things that they don't want to do and blame it on something else. And Jessica and I have a, a dear friend, Brittany Richmond, that you should definitely get on the show, that she's an anxiety speaker um, for teens. And one of the things that she say says is that my anxiety is not your problem. And I, I really found a lot of power in that because that means she has control over it and she doesn't extend that out. Now, there's so many different circumstances with every individual. So you can't cast this broad statement. There are ways, though, that people can learn how to manage the things that they have and not use them as an excuse, because that's what I see a lot of times. Like, I can't do that. I have X. I can't do that or can't go there because I have this issue. Well, you know, you may just have to work harder than somebody else to to overcome those certain um, challenges that you have, because everybody has their own individual challenges that they have to work around and figure out how to overcome. Mm. And I see sometimes, and I'm curious to you guys see this as well, that we have, this is not a big percentage, obviously, but I have seen both parents and young people search for a label to give themselves a reason for not taking agency and not taking responsibility and not mm -hmm. being, I, I want to have, I want to have this diagnosis because it gives me an out. I'm not de, you know, diminishing any kind of diagnosis at all. I, please, audience, don't get me wrong on what I'm saying. I just have seen that occasionally that they're searching for that. Well, I, you know, I've got to do this and I, and I think I'm this. I need to go get tested for it so I'll know that I'm this. Yes, I have seen that. I've absolutely seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a, and that's a, that's where value of coaching can come in to help them to have that self actualization during that process. So, why do you guys think coaching now is is a viable option uh, for youth when hey I'm I'm in my early 50s in the 80s you know we didn't we didn't have if you were a coach you were on the athletic field I mean that's yes. a term that was used then uh, why why is it now why why is it valued now why is it needed now okay so I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way but coaching is incredibly helpful for young people and where where we're seeing like therapy not necessarily helping young people at times there are some young people who do need to go to therapists but then I get clients who are like I went to a therapist and they weren't helping me and I didn't feel like I got anywhere and I really didn't like to talk about my feelings with a stranger and I felt worse when I left right one thing we have to remember, or at least be aware of, is teenagers, their brains are developing at a very rapid pace. So they feel all those like excitatory emotions, all of the depressive emotions, um, the things that push them to go out and practice like or do experience risky behavior. They, they do that because they get a thrill that you and I, we don't get anymore. You know, that that's the downside of becoming an adult is like you don't experience these emotions at the same level anymore. Things aren't as exciting mm. for you anymore, but also those, those sad moments, the ones where you're having to rehash why maybe you're feeling anxious or you're feeling depressed, that they, they also feel them much bigger, right? So not most people that you don't necessarily get excited about going to therapy, but if you're an adult, you're going because you want to do work and you feel good about the work that you do. If you're a teenager, sometimes you go and you don't want to, you're not looking forward to it. 
is you come out feeling worse again, back to the way that the brain is developing and how they're feeling those emotions, coaching meets them where they're at with what they've got and is like, all right, let's go. Let's do some work. We're not digging around in the mud. We're not going down into those roots in that respect that therapy does. We are meeting you at the ground level and we're helping you grow the branches and grow the leaves. And, you know, sometimes we might have to say, did something happen that led you to think you're bad at math, right? But we're not doing therapy. So when our kids are walking out of our sessions, they're like, hey, I have some tools and I can use them right now. And it feels good to use them. And I'm getting some dopamine, possibly if I'm engaged and I am doing the work, I'm getting some dopamine from this experience. So it's, it's just a more positive experience. Teenagers really need that. They crave that and they crave solutions and they crave that agency. The, the thing that gives them the power and the control to make the decisions. Coaching, coaching gives them that. I think think coaching too. Go go ahead. No. Well, I was just going to say that a lot of folks, I think when they could use coaching, go to counseling. And as David Wright, who is our lead coach trainer and the executive coach for the Ziegler Corporation, has said many times, counseling is really designed to deal with past experiences that are prohibiting you from going forward. Where coaching, we may discuss things that happened in the past, but we're really focused more on assessing where are you right now? helping you decide where do you want to go and helping you get there. And what I love when David describes this is he goes all the way back to the root word of coach. You know, that it really is a carriage. It's a mode of transportation. That's what the original word was. He says, so if we take it in its original word, that it's a mode of transportation. What is the, what was the stagecoach? Stagecoach figured out where you were. It picked you up. It, you told it where you wanted to go. And then it took you there. And that's what coaching can do. And, and that's one of the things, too, is a, as a coach needs to know, too, at, at that point in time, any kind of life coach needs to know, too, is uh, when they have a client that needs to be partnered with a with a counselor. Because, you know, sometimes they come to coaching when they really need to see someone. Yes. Um, but very often they go to counseling when they probably could use a coach. Uh, Jeff, you want to add to our... Yeah, well, one, you, stole, you stole part of what I was going to say, so good. <laughs> we're definitely in synergy here. The yeah. other part, when you were talking about why is coaching become so popular, it's been decades of the stigma, the negative stigma of coaching being removed because adults now see it as a viable option. That wasn't fun to see. So. <laughs> <laughs> That was good timing too. Um, but the the idea of that, that's one of the positive things of social media. You see all these high, high performers, these, these big executives that have a lot of influence, not only because of their financial status, it may have been because of their military status or their professional athlete status, all utilize coaches. And so they start explaining why coaching is so important, where you now see decision makers, adults, uh, corporations, seeing how valuable third-party support is. And now that's trickling down into the home where we say, and James, we talked about it, Jessica and I talk about all the time, is we say a lot of the same things that the parents say. It's Mm -hmm. just a different way and a different voice. And that's why coaches, teachers, youth pastors, aunts, uncles have all had big impact in most people's adolescent life because they're saying the same thing in a different way. And it's just not mom and dad telling me to clean my room. It's a coach saying, where's the value in making sure that your room's clean every day? Where's the value of getting things done a little bit every day than waiting to the last minute? And having that echoed, not just from a parent's perspective, but from this whole community around them of going, okay, my coach is telling this, my teacher's telling me this, my parents are telling me this. Well, now my coach is telling me this. There must be some value in that. And like Jessica had said, as young people from a physiological development standpoint, that frontal lobe is not there yet. So they don't see two steps ahead. They can barely see their toes in front of them. And so they don't have that ability of why risk is not risk for most young people because they don't anticipate the consequences where as adults, we've already played that scenario out and 
and imagined all the bad things that would happen of why we shouldn't do something where they're like, okay, let's just do it and figure it out. And that's where that overall coaching helps because then it's like, okay, well, let's talk through the decisions that you're going to make and what are the upsides and the downside? Because a good coach allows that freedom of discussion and imagination to happen because the answer is inside everybody. We just need somebody who's talented enough to pull it out of us. So we hear it in our own words. Hmm. Audience, you getting this stuff? I hope you are getting this stuff. I hope we see some, I started to say tweets. Do we still call it tweets now that this platform's called X? I don't, I don't know what know. we call it anymore. Uh, <laughs> you know, with some hash, we need to see some hashtags on these comments here. When you guys were talking about the teenage brain, I was reminded of a of a, a book by Jeremy and Joshua Clark called Your Teenager is Not Crazy. And they described the teenage mind in, as a metaphor of a high-speed, you know, sports car that has extremely sensitive accelerator that'll go zero to a thousand miles an hour just by touching it. And it has brakes that work, but you got to push them all the way down to the floor and it takes a while for them to engage, but they will engage. And their analogy is, is that you by far know that they're supposed to hit the brakes on the things that they're doing in their life and they're trying. It just doesn't work as fast as that excitement accelerator that they just touch and it, boom. He said, and that's why they make some of the dumb decisions that they have in life. He says, it's not they're being malicious. It's just, yeah, God took They're learning. Yeah. They're learning. And that's, you can't build the neural pathway, the neural pathway without the experience. You have to, you know, it's like trying to write a book, but you don't know words. So it, something I, I either heard or read, um, it could have been in the book, The Teenage Brain, it's written by a, a, a brain person. I think I had a <laughs> neurologist. A neurologist. Um, but uh, over there on my shelves. So. Yeah, I think she talks about how a teenager and an adult they can eat the same piece of candy, and they will taste it in a completely different level. And they've done like um, studies, brain studies of a human adult and a human child or teenager eating the same piece of candy. And the everything that's firing off in the brain of the teenager is far more um, bright on the, on the scan than with the adult. Because those excitatory sensors, those neuro pathways that are all fresh and brand new are just like, yeah, I really like this. It's so great. And it's not really the adult is like, oh, the complexities, or I taste a little of this, or I taste a little of that. It's a more thoughtful way maybe of tasting the same piece of candy. Um, but they just don't, they don't measure the same. And we have to be fair as parents because we'll look at our teenagers and we're like, you did something that looked like an adult. You kind of look like an adult. You made some really smart decisions. And now you're doing this over here. And I'm so angry at you. I can't believe you would do that. What do you mean you can't believe they would do that? They're a teenager. Of course they're going to do these things. So we have to, we really have to monitor ourselves and give our teenagers grace and partner with them to help them come to the right decisions instead of the lectures or the, you know, these, these things that we can sometimes do because we're emotionally attached. Mm -hmm. So our emotions, they engage when our kids do things that we're like, I can't believe you'd be so stupid. You got to give them some slack. Well, Maybe yeah. now the third time though, that's a right. different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we talked about at the beginning, Jessica had mentioned it and James, you mentioned it as well, programming. And you think about where we want them to act their age. We've said that it's like, you're 15, you should act like you're 15. Well, Jessica just explained what a 15 year old is going to act like. But let's think about as a parent, how we're programming our kids to act. So John Eldridge wrote a fantastic book called Wild at Heart. Mm -hmm. And in that, he Which challenged- I gave to my son at age 15, by the way. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a wonderful book because he challenges parents as well to think about we're programming our children because we call them babies. You're my baby. You're my princess. You're- these different things. And so in one token, you're telling your son that, you know, you need to act your age and let's, let's get, get somewhere. And then in the very next tone is like, Oh, but you're my baby, you're my baby boy. And so you're reinforcing 
this motherly attitude of you don't have to grow up. You're my baby. You're you're this person where you have to think about giving them the freedom and permission to grow up and to think. And you wouldn't think that a little word choice like that is. But I've challenged my wife and even myself of what are we saying? What are we how are we calling my 15 year old who's the size of a man? Am I calling him? Is she calling him her baby? Or it's like you're a young man now. Let's start treating you like a young man. And she and I can talk about he's our baby. And then or my daughter, as much of a princess as she is for me, is I have to be careful because now I'm programming her that she's a princess and that the whole world should bow down to her feet. And then it's just setting her up for not the success that's needed. I can reinforce how much I love her by not calling her a princess. So I'm a big believer in proper programming. And we talked about that fixed mindset is that I'm not capable, I'm not smart, I'm not all these things, is that we have to reprogram their brain and give them positive affirmations to say that will take, a, you know, it takes us as adults years for the, that positive programming to take place. And young people it won't take as long, but it needs to be reinforced over and over again. So that way they start to believe in themselves and they shift from that fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And we're looking at a, at a time in that, you know, culture and technology has changed so dramatically that those of us who are adults, we're not prepared to use the things that we have created. And youth are just responding to the world that we've given them. And we're expecting them to have the same kind of abilities that maybe previous generations did at their age. But previous generations, yes, they were encountering the same problems. These problems that we talk about are pretty eternal. I mean, you can see them all the way through. If you don't believe me, go watch Leave It to Beaver episodes from the late 50s. They talk about self-image relationships and purpose and goals. And those literally, just look at it from that perspective. You'll see their sitcom writers do that. Yeah. But... The, the, it, they're just manifesting themselves in such different ways now. They need that outside influence to help guide them through. And that's where I really see the value of someone walking alongside them and, and with them on that journey. All right. Let's just hope that, that the, the people who've stayed with us this long in the conversation are excited about coaching. The question that I would have if I was listening to this is, okay, how does it work? How, what, what's the process? So t take us through a process if someone came to you, what would you do with them? How, how would you help a 15-year-old, that 15-year-old boy that we were talking, hypothetically talking about? You want me to go? Yep, you go. <laughs> I went loud. Okay. Okay. Right. Sure. I go. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it all, it all starts with the parents and what the parents are experiencing, right? What do they see from their point of view? Then we, we chat with, the client themselves. What are you seeing? What do you want to work on? Are you prepared to do this work? We create some realizations and then we start our journey. And I mean, our process is every week for an hour for six weeks. And then from there, we are, we should be in a really good place. We should be gaining some momentum, the rapport, the trust, it's all there. We have been seen as an ally and as a partner and a cheerleader, and we shift into bi-weekly. So within about six weeks, we're able to deliver the framework of our ETA program to our clients. And then we are in, in a sense, we're shifting into maintenance mode and we're making sure that they are staying the plan. We do the work, we work the plan. That's the name of our workbook and our planner, the work and the plan. But before we even do that, we get our goals right, right? We learn what our values are, how we're showing up, what our vision is, what our mission is. We do all of these great things and we follow them along. And sometimes parents invite us to be part of the journey for four months, six months, a year. I have some clients I've been with for over a year and they're off to college and I'm still with them as they're at college because they still need that partnership. They need that person, that safe person to go to. So that's kind of like how it works. Uh, we have those one hour sessions at whatever cadence we've agreed on and we help them work through their limiting beliefs. We help them work through the things they wish they handled better or they felt more confident about. And we help them be courageous in the learning process. 
Uh, I feel very strongly, and I've said this to many, many people, you cannot be confident without having courage first. You don't wake up as an expert in anything. You have to courageously go out, put yourself out there to experience whatever it is. You gather that feedback, you adjust accordingly, and then you go at it again, right? It takes that courage to then develop the confidence to do anything in life. And I think if I were to boil down what we do is we help our clients be courageous so they can then be confident and so they can then be successful. I love that. Say that again on the confidence and courageous. Uh, say that again. That's hashtag. Uh, it's hashtagable. Uh, you have to have courage before you can have confidence. Courage before confidence. Hashtag courage before confidence. We sound so old. <laughs> oh I don't even know if people are using hashtags anymore. <laughs> Well, I am. So there you go. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love I love that process. I love that that they're engaging. And and what has been some of the results that you've seen from some of the clients that you've had come through, or some of the testimonies that you have? You sure you want to ask me that out? question? I get so excited. Well, that I was just um, time for you to <laughs> share some some success stories because that's that's the exciting yeah. part of it. Sure. Well, our ETA program is very impactful. We have been full-time at this for just over a year and a half. We've helped over 150 local families. We've even worked virtually with families as well. And I say families because when you work with a teenager, you're improving the whole ecosystem in which the teenager is inhabiting. So the families feel the, the effects as well. But some of our clients have gone from not, not even thinking they want to go to college to applying, getting accepted to the top school and knowing exactly what they want to major in. Some of our clients have come in with debilitating anxiety to the point that they can't and won't speak to other people. So that's formally diagnosed as selective mutism. And we've helped them very effectively in our groups overcome some of these really big challenges, anxiety, social awkwardness, social skills, uh, emotional uh, control, things like that, um, building resilience. Uh, we've got countless stories. Jeff's got stories. Our other coaches have stories. It's just been really, really rewarding to see these young people overcome and, and love their lives. We had a coach that uh, came through our program and was certified, and she sent me a screenshot of a text that she received from one of her first clients. Mm -hmm. uh, she came through our program last September, and she got this. She sent it to me sometime in January or February. And this, she's in, uh, she's from South Carolina. She's in Western part of the state. And she, and the, it just simply said, you have given me my son back. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. We have heard and, that. And I just, I just have my story. Time. Yeah, we love like, oh, that. Gosh. And that right there is exactly what I meant by we are working with families. We're helping mm -hmm. heal families and heal parent child relationships and uh, you know, minimize that divide and that power struggle. Um, we just interviewed somebody about a month ago, right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. And the mom, we actually have a video of it. The mom said exactly that. We can go on vacations. We can enjoy time together. And you gave me my son back. And it's, and it's a, to oh. echo what Jeff has said repeatedly, it's not that you're, we're teaching or saying or showing them something that maybe their parents had not, but it's with a different voice and with a process. That's that's one of the other things too. Is we have coaches have good solid processes to help to get them from point A to point B. We we know where the stage coach is supposed to go. We've been there before. We actually mapped out the route. We've traveled the route. We know the pitfalls that are going to be on the route. Let us help you go there. You don't yeah. need to go there on your own when someone can help you. Should we change the name of highlight to ways? <laughs> Google Maps. Hey, there's a, Hey, I did a podcast. I'm not a podcast. I did a blog post, uh, about a half a year ago on, uh, the, my comparison from the ways app to coaching. Cause we were doing, yeah. I was traveling to a coaching service yeah, I and I was, and I had heard that there was, I saw all these, uh, signs that said, uh, wreck you know delays and all this stuff so i punched in ways i was like what's the way around it and i was listening to it and all the things that it was doing you know rerouting and stuff but just the verbiage that it was using you know uh obstacle ahead so we're going to take it slow and easy and i thought well that's a coach uh that can tell them 
there's something up here that's going on here or caution, you know, uh, cop, you know, I don't know. What does it say? A police officer. Maybe he just wants to say hi. And I thought, you know, that's the case telling him that there are things. Red light, life red light camera reported ahead. Yeah. yeah. All those types of things. Well, now we'll definitely show so a, funny you said that. Yeah. It's like back in the day we could go to AAA and get a triptych. Right. And, and be able to get that, that had each page went where we needed to go. Well, that was our generation's version of ways, which it used to be books. If we wanted self-development, we wanted help and figure things out. We had to go get it. And then we had to follow each of these pages. And so now with coaches, it's, it is like ways that we walk alongside you and help identify certain obstacles and then ask, okay, how are you going to get around it? So, you know, where we're like ways, we're also different because we're going to challenge them to say, okay, there's a, a fork in the road, which way are you going to go? And then why did you choose that decision to go that way? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of fun because what Jessica had said before around confidence is they start to believe in their ability to make decisions and they know how to make a decision through critical thinking, which is not being taught. It's it's a critical thinking is a lost art. And it's just tell me where I need to go. I'm going to go. So that's the downside to ways. A coach is going to challenge you of saying, OK, you can go that way. Why do you want to go that way? And what potential obstacles are you going to have to face? Do you have enough gas? Do you have money for tolls? Do you have all these things? Or you can go this way. So which one would it be? And then you have to learn how to make the decision of, am I going to go the right fork or the left fork? Coach teaches them how to use a map. Uh, yes. <laughs> so that they can, when they leave us, they can take a map and plot their own course and be successful getting there without relying on something else. So I hope our audience has, has caught a vision. How can they get in touch with you guys? What are some ways they can get in touch with you guys that they want to learn more about what you do and see if it's the right fit, especially if they're in your area. How can they connect with you guys? Uh, so this is a fun fact. We actually have coaches in Valdosta, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Chicago, Illinois. And then we have five coaches, six coaches right here in the central Florida area. They can find us on Instagram at highlight.coaching. You can find us on Facebook at Highlight Coaching. And of course, our website is highlightcoaching.com and we have an app. So we just oh. hit the app stores on Google Play and Apple App Store. It's Highlight Coaching. So H-I-L-I-T-E, spelt phonetically, and you will find us there. You can download the app. We've got some free tools and you can connect with us further. You can learn about our programs and all of that other fun stuff. Well, thank you guys uh, for your time today. I I hope that our audience has gotten excited as much as I have during this time. Uh, Cause I, I see such value in what you do. I, I want to hear more about the success stories. I want you guys to send me the, uh, the, the, the information and stuff, because that, that excites me and it, and it keeps me motivated to find folks who have this kind of passion and equip them with the tools they need so that they can be effective. Uh, to do this, give them a process so that they have that confidence. If they'll just have the courage to come to us. So, ah, I, got yeah. there. So, <laughs> I like what you do. I'll, have, <laughs> I'll, I'll be stealing that pretty soon. Mr. Ziegler said the first time you you quote somebody, you say, as Jessica once said, you know, courage comes before confidence. Second time is, as someone I heard once said, the third time is, as I've always said. So eventually this will be my quote. I just want you to know that. Uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> you know what? I already submitted my application to the USPTO. So. <laughs> There's going to be a trademark on that very soon. <laughs> okay. a little tea on in that, so. Thank you guys for our time. Thank you, audience, for sticking with us. If you stuck with us this long, then you found value in this conversation and someone that you know really needs to hear this as well so please like and share and comment on this podcast so it can reach a bigger audience and we'll see guys thank you again thank you jessica thank you jeff thank you, thank you so much and we'll see everyone again next week on the generation youth podcast